Cyber security is a priority for the Australian government and for Austrade. There has been significant investment into AusCyber, the Australian Industry Growth Centre, and a key partner of ours. Together, AusCyber and Austrade have hosted Australia House at the annual RSA conference in San Francisco. Actually, it was one of the last events that I attended before COVID started. We assist in building relationships, highlighting new business opportunities, and facilitating critical introductions for both Australian, US, and Canadian companies and investors. It's my honour today to introduce you to our esteemed panellists, who will be providing their unique experience, perspectives, and insights into our topic of emerging trends in cyber in a post-COVID landscape. They all have extensive experience in cyber, and many don't need an introduction. Uh, we've got Alistair McGibbon. Alistair is the Chief Strategy Officer at StrategyX, the largest end-to-end -end cyber solution in Australia. Prior to that, Alistair was Deputy Secretary of the National Cyber Security um, in Australia's Department of Home Affairs. He was the head of the Australian Cyber Security Centre and the Deputy Director General at the Australian Business Directorate. He was also a Special Advisor to the Prime Minister on Cyber Security. We've also got Dr. Zulfika Ramzan. Zulfika is the Chief Technology Officer at RSA, where he is responsible for developing RSA's technology strategy. He's also been CTO and Chief Scientist to several companies that were acquired by Bluecoat, Cisco, and Sourcefire. And also Steve Ingram. Steve's the Managing Director with EY in New York and their American Cyber Lead. Steve previously established PwC's cyber security business in Australia. Steve has more than 30 years of financial crime experience, specialising in forensic services. Steve has also led many transformational programs for two of Australia's big four banks. So welcome to our discussion today, panellists. Now to start off, Alistair, I'd like you to, I'd like to invite you to, to address our audience. Thank you. Well, thank you very much and a great pleasure to be with you today. You'd be pleased to know I've started my stopwatch. I have seven minutes and then I have the pleasure of handing over to my friend, Steve Ingram. Well, there's no doubt, of course, we know, and it's trite to say that we have bifurcated economies. Uh, those people who can work from home have now started to work from home. And we, we're the privileged uh, part of the economy who can do that. And I suspect many people on this call uh, are in, are in that boat. We need to recognise, of course, that many people haven't been able to change the way they work and that they're therefore much more exposed to, to the vagaries of our economy and to uh, COVID-19. But for those of us who have been able to change the way we've worked, we've clearly also changed the technologies and the way we deploy our staff to work. We know that we've extended uh, our perimeter of organisations. It's been a desire of organisations for quite some time to be able to uh, move their staff uh, 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 into their homes uh, and to change the way they work. And they many managed to do that over a 24 hour period. What we have seen, of course, is that's changed the threat vectors um, that, our, that attackers are using. We've certainly seen an increase uh, at least in Australia, uh, in activity by nation states targeting uh, workers at home, and we've definitely seen criminal groups do the same. Now, that's logical because the mix of technologies that we're using uh, has shifted, and the way in which people are working has shifted. And what we do know is that nation states and criminals target the wet layer, they target the end user. Uh, and end users are now not just in their offices, uh, theoretically at least focusing on their work, they're often multitasking, uh, they can be distracted, and in some respects, distressed and concerned. And uh, criminals and nation states play upon those emotions and those distractions to carry out their activities. Now, um, if I talk about uh, the, the nature of the threat actors, criminal groups will always pivot to whatever the latest crisis is. Uh, those who know Australia well know that we've had a pretty remarkable year. Uh, we had many months of, of wildfires and bushfires that swept across uh, most states in Australia in a manner that we'd never seen before. We used the phrase unprecedented many times from about October last year 
through to February or so this year. Um, we had a brief month off when some rain came and everyone thought life would return to normal and we had um, the distinct disruption that comes with COVID-19. Now, Australia is in a unique situation because we've recovered from at least the first wave of COVID-19 uh, in a manner uh, that puts us in the top couple of countries uh, and as a consequence um, puts us in a different geopolitical situation as we recover. But we, we've also started to, frankly uh, speaking, um, come against some of the other uh, significant players in our region. There's no doubt that our relationship with China is um, less positive than it has been in previous years. Uh, and uh, as a result, I would suspect we would see more activities um, coming from the Chinese government against institutions in Australia. Now, I'm not linking this next event, uh, this next series of events, please, so I want to make that very clear. But we have seen um, an, an unusual uptick in the number of iconic Australian businesses that have been affected uh, by uh, ransomware, which is not traditionally a nation state activity. I'm going to put an asterisk there and say, well, North Korea and Russia have certainly had a habit of doing that from time to time. Um, but uh, but uh, we've certainly seen some iconic companies affected by cybersecurity matters, Blue Scope, Toll, Lion Brewing, and others that I can't disclose that are certainly going through some significant cyber incidents. Now, the Australian cybersecurity story, as I note my time, is an interesting one. Why would people in the United States be interested to talk to an Australian about cybersecurity? Well, I'm hoping they are. Um, our journey started in April 2016 with our former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull launching what was then probably the world's most stretchy cybersecurity strategy, well funded, an intention of not looking at just the threat, but the opportunity associated with cybersecurity. He bolstered the agencies that I uh, ended up uh, having the pleasure of, of being a senior leader in, but he also invested very heavily in the development of cybersecurity skills. Uh, and you've already mentioned the concept of, for example, Oz Cyber and, and indeed our friends at Oz Trade um, and, and more broadly in, in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, and that concept of scale up and start up businesses. One of the pitches I would make to you is that COVID-19 has led to uh, the desire for greater sovereign capabilities in manufacturing. There's no doubt we've seen it in the United States. We've certainly had that dialogue in Australia and we see that popping up in lots of other countries. That same sense of the need for a sovereignty when it comes to uh, manufacturing is now applying to our cybersecurity uh, capabilities as well. The need for us as nations, particularly I believe as Western nations, to be able to act um, together uh, to protect uh, to protect our citizenry is important. Now we all hear of Israel as a as a very important cybersecurity hub. I've travelled to Israel. I think it's a remarkable country, and I think their cybersecurity startup and scale up market is is indeed wonderful. I'm talking to people, many of whom I'm sure are in the west coast of the United States, and I've had a long and wonderful engagement with the west coast of the United States. But I'd say to you that Australia has some extraordinarily innovative people, has some remarkable engineering and science talent that has always regarded itself um, as somehow behind and below other people. In fact, we've often talked about the brain drain in Australia. If you want to be successful, you go um, to other countries to, to not just kickstart your career, but often end it. Um, what I'd say to you is this. We've handled COVID-19 well. I don't think anyone's hanging up a mission accomplished sign. Um, we've certainly started finding some muscularity when it comes to the role that Australia needs to play in the region, as any good democratic sovereign nation should. Um, and I'd say to you that uh, once planes are allowed to start flying again, we have a remarkable accelerated uh, immigration plan for those people um, who have technical skills. Uh, and cybersecurity is one of the technical skills we need as a nation, and I believe we possess now as a nation will continue to grow. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my, uh, my clock tells me that I've just spoken for seven minutes, which, uh, which is right on target. And it's my pleasure now to pass over to my old friend, Steve Ingram, who, uh, who is one of those brain drains and gone over. I notice he's sitting in a car. Um, so I'm going to pass over to my friend, Steve, if I may. Great catching up. Great to see you. And yes, I'm sitting in my car. I mean, I'm homeless. It just means that I had a series of appointments and circumstances today that didn't gel the way I was hoping they would. 
Um, and uh, it, it, to me as well, it's a great pleasure to be uh, presenting with you and to presenting uh, with this audience. I think uh, what I'd like to talk about is some of the differences or some of the things I've seen in the Australian market that would be different to the US. And I think whilst it looks the same and feels the same, there are some subtle differences. I think one of them is that in the US, I've found it's a cut to the chase. Let's just get to the point, whereas in Australia, there's more time in the subtleties, I think, in getting to know one another, uh, getting to trust one another. And at the end of the day, if you're developing and, and selling a product, it's people that the, uh, that the clients buy. It's not the product, it's, it's you. So taking that time and not being uh, too brash, I think it'd be welcome. I think um, there's a, a greater level of humbleness in Australia. Success is, is fantastic. People love hearing um, about hard work, but they don't always celebrate success in Australia the same way they do in America. So it's well regarded, but it's not well when it's worn, if you know what I mean. We don't want to be too flashy with it. And then just because a product has been developed in the US doesn't mean it's going to go quickly in Australia. It's a really a sense of starting small, having a local presence, even if, again, that's a small presence, but starting small and building out and letting the product build a reputation, letting you build a brand and a reputation for yourself. As Al Mac said, we have an amazing market. And in terms of a startup or a company going to Australia, it's rare to see something that's big enough like the Australian economy, but not too big. We've got coordination through the government's strategy, through the former prime minister's launch of that strategy and recent renewal. We've got the uh, the various functions within government. We've got public-private sector cooperation through a board in each state. Um, people are madly supporting startups such as the EY Foundry. Uh, there's laws like mandatory breach notification. And Australia is a hot target. So it's a great test bench because you've got scale, but it's not overwhelming. You can get to everyone you need uh, within a day and you don't have the same level of bureaucracy that you might find in the US simply because the scale in the US is so mind blowing compared to Australia. A good way to go into the market there as well is not just to be there to earn money, right? It's to contribute back. Australians love it if they feel that you're there to make a contribution. There's a program I'm sure you're familiar with called Cyber Patriot. Um, uh, Oz Cyber brought that to Australia a couple of years ago. You know, get involved in that, get involved in SciRise in Victoria, uh, get involved in education, but having that contribution back to the, the, not just the local economy, but the local community is typically well regarded. But just to echo with Almac, uh, we've got ransomware, we've got um, third party cyber funds, we've got regulations. People are focused, I think, on uh, optimizing the security operations. Automation is big because skills are short. Competition for talent is high. Uh, anything we can automate is fantastic. Identity, as in the US, identity is still a big issue in Australia. Um, cloud, securing cloud, and particularly as we move, like who'd have thought we could operate as effectively the way we have uh, post COVID? I mean, for years, people have been talking about working remotely, working from home, working from your car. Um, major banks have, dis have disaggregated their trading operations and they're operating from people's kitchens. Things that were just not possible before are possible now, but they need new infrastructure to support that. I think there's a great appetite for cloud transformation. Uh, at the end of the day, like anything in cyber, cloud is about people. It's the people, the way they embrace it, the way they deploy it, the way they, they build it up. That's an important aspect. To um, practicality. Um, getting the basics right, getting the foundations right, and don't um, don't over decorate your solutions. Right? So as much as I said, it's not a cut to the chase. It's about building the relationship at the same time. The last thing that you'd want to do is to over promise or um, you know inflate the credentials that you have around the solution that you're proposing because they will smell that in a heartbeat. And if Australians have anything, it's a long memory. And once you damage that reputation, uh, it takes a long time to recover. Um, I think they are the main points that I wanted to cover and reinforce. It's big, but it's not too big. There's a lot of coordination and at a government to public interface, it's very well co coordinated in each state. 
there's a great appetite, there's a desire, Austrade, Ostcyber, Cyrise to get more innovation underway. Uh, I think the, the the three learnings I would take back would be um, it looks the same, but it's not. So just beware, it's about people, build trust and relationship, be a little bit humble. They want to know you're successful, but don't wear the success and um, just make sure that you're not overdressing your solution. Australia is a little bit unique. Uh, I think we always punch above our weight. I don't think we've got big enough scale where you can have a specialist in left-handed screwdrivers. You've got to be multi-purpose, and I think most of our people take a multi-purpose approach and, uh, and they'll smell, if things aren't quite right, they'll smell them. But Australia would welcome uh, companies and heading down. Excellent. Um, Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Excellent. Zulfika, I'll pass over to you. Well, sure. First of all, I wanted to say thank you to uh, to each of you, to Austrade, to Adet, to Emma, for giving me the opportunity to uh, to be on this panel today. Uh, and I want to start by talking about the relationship between RSA and Australia. It actually goes quite far back. I mean, in fact, one of the most pivotal moments in RSA's history happened in, in the 90s. And we found some really great technology being built out of a company in Australia um, around encryption. And, and uh, it was so good that RSA decided to buy the company and establish actually a beachhead in Australia. The technology that that company built is now one of the most widely deployed pieces of software in the world, if not the most widely deployed software in the world. So every time you go online, every time you make a digital transaction, every time you engage digitally, there's a good chance that it's that technology, those lines of code written by some of the top minds in Australia that are protecting that transaction and giving you trust in a digital experience. And I can tell you that just that one story alone has been very powerful. Obviously, we've been working closely with with the region, not only through the membership with the five eyes and working with the five eyes, but more importantly, through our customer base, uh, many of our top accounts, many of those iconic brands that Alistair mentioned are our customers of RSA is something we take very seriously. And we've um, really been honored to have that presence in the country. And I can tell you now more than ever, that presence is critical because if anything, we've learned that COVID-19 has been the greatest accelerant, the digital transformation that we've seen in recent times. Think about the way our lives have been transformed over the past few months. We have supplanted so many of our physical experiences with virtual interactions. We're doing virtual birthday parties and funerals and weddings. We're working remotely. We're buying groceries through the comfort of our own homes. And each of those capabilities was made possible through digital transformation. And so as you can imagine, for a lot of our customers, going into the COVID-19 situation, they were challenged. All of a sudden, they were forced to embrace digital transformation in a way that was perhaps somewhat unique to the way they've experienced things in the past. Uh, first and foremost, they had to enable a remote workforce. And so we would get calls on a Friday afternoon saying, hey, can you get us to enable 3,000 people by Monday morning remotely? And uh, that was quite a daunting challenge because normally when people think about enabling a remote workforce, they tend to think about that aspect in much larger timescales where they have weeks or months to make that a reality. Suddenly we were taking that process and driving it down to hours, but we also knew that if we didn't succeed, those companies would not be able to meet their promises to their customers. And so we worked feverishly with those companies to help them enable a remote workforce, provided them with secure authentication capabilities, multi-factor authentication so they could allow their employees to connect to their back office. Now a lot of our customers are interested in, in other areas. For example, how do they deal with the governance and life cycle of digital identities? That's a topic that's come up repeatedly when people are working from home, when they're remote, digital identity becomes the main facet of identity that we interact with. And how you think about the governance and life cycle of those identities becomes really crucial. The second key problem that's come up beyond digital identity management and governance is around the security operations center. Historically, the security operations center was a room in a facility somewhere where people would get together, investigate incidents. They would have war rooms set up. They'd bring in key stakeholders and battle these problems together. The idea of a physical room is no longer the case. In the post-COVID-19 era, the security operations center is now virtual. Everybody's working remotely. How do you handle those critical incidents? How do you make sure that your organization is resilient in that new, more modern era? That's the second problem we've been helping a lot of our customers tackle. A third problem is how do you manage digital risk? And in general, how do you engage in a much more integrated risk management posture? If you think about areas like third-party risk, you know we talked about ransomware earlier. Ransomware may impact your organization and certainly you have to deal with that. What if it impacts one of your suppliers and they can't supply you with something as a result? All of a sudden, even though you haven't been directly impacted with ransomware, 
ransomware has become a critical third-party vendor risk that you've got to address. And so a lot of our customers are thinking about areas like third-party vendor risk, annuity risk, and what it means in light of COVID-19. And then the final area, which I think is one that people often overlook, but we certainly help a lot of our customers with, is in the area of fraud and risk intelligence. And a lot of those customers are banks and credit card companies, uh, many of them located uh, in Australia. And quite frankly, just think about what's happened. How many of your transactions have you done online recently compared to where you were in the past? That number has gone up astronomically. And guess what? That means threat actors are in that space with much more frequency than they have been in the past. Uh, one great example, I was talking to one of our customers uh, and they're in the grocery sector. So they sell groceries effectively. They saw an 800% increase that's 8x increase in the number of online fraud attempts at their grocery chains, mainly because when people are buying more groceries, threat actors are right there waiting for them to make a mistake and trying to pilfer important information in that process. And so one of the strange things with our industry is that when times are tough, it does draw out the worst in people, including the worst of cyber criminals. And so our job, I would say, you know, never gets a moment of rest in that capacity. But I think it also means that we have an important responsibility to fulfill. Uh, you know, beyond that, I think looking at the response in Australia, it's been amazing. Uh, you know, I, I guarantee, obviously, you can't put a mission accomplished flag up, but I wish I'm envious of Australia when I think about where we are in the US compared to where you are in Australia. I think the difference is about two orders of magnitude in terms of progress in being able to deal with COVID-19. And I think as a result, a lot of the organizations in Australia are going to be thinking about the next step. How do I bring in people back to the workforce? reintroduce people into society safely and do that in a way that continues to preserve my ability to provide key services to our customers. So I want to close by saying that the stakes have never been higher than what we do. We are embracing digital in an unprecedented way. And for us to be successful, people have to have trust in a digital experience. And as cybersecurity professionals, our goal is to enable that trust, to engender trustworthiness in digital systems. And for me, Australia has been a key market for us uh, and not just at RSA, but even in my prior lives at some of the startups I mentioned, our first international forays, our first international customers were actually always in Australia because Australia is forward leaning in terms of where technology should be going. Number one, number two, there was no language barrier. So it was very easy for people in the US to translate their sales internationally to Australia. And number three, you have a lot of large organizations that care a lot about cyber and are willing to make those investments to bring cyber capabilities in house and to provide capabilities for their customers. So thank you, and, and uh, I'll pass the floor back to Odette. Excellent. Uh, thanks, everyone. That was really insightful. So I think we've heard about, you know, digital transformation has taken place in four months, the sort of things that we might have expected to take 10 years, uh, that we've seen increased cyber attacks and fraud. Um, are we seeing any trends in Australia that we're not seeing in other parts of the world? Um, or are there new challenges and opportunities that have been created uh, because of COVID? So I might start with that. I'm not if we didn't have a batting order, but but I did. I, I think one of the things we have seen, and I made a brief reference to it. There's no doubt that if we look at Australia and the US, we sit geopolitically quite differently. The US being a superpower means it has that role in the world that that you know brings it into to, to touch a range of nations. Australia being um, you know much smaller and a, and a middle a middle power. And uh, obviously, you know, it's a no brainer. If you look at the globe, we sit in a different part of the world means that we do see threat actors in a different way. I, I've, I've mentioned some nation states and I don't want to dwell on them too long, but there's no doubt that um, that Australia's view of China is fundamentally different to the United States. You know, China will be much more cautious in its activities in dealing with the United States uh, may not seem like that from a US point of view, then it will be in dealing with an Australia, a much smaller country, geographically much closer, much more influential on the Australian economy. What that actually gives my US friends, I'm sorry, I'm going very dark here. It's very bright and sunny here in, uh, I'm in sunny Sydney today, normally uh, slightly colder Canberra, um, uh, is that that it, it means that you will see different threats come at different times. And that's actually very useful if you've got a footprint in the United States and a footprint in Australia. One thing I will say is that the threat intelligence you need then to protect entities is sometimes different. And often our threat intelligence, of course, quite logically, comes from the United States being the dominant player in technology. Thank goodness, I'd say. Um, and we need to keep it that way. Um, uh, but but you know, so there is a nuance that's needed 
Um, from a criminal point of view, the cr criminals, I've always said, are very agnostic to the colour of the cash that they get. So a scammer that's going to scam a US audience will tend to scam in the Anglosphere and, and, you know, do that across Australia, the UK, Canada and New Zealand and other such places. So criminals, I suspect, are slightly more generic. The nation state threats evolve and push. Nations are careful not to go too far often. Uh, but there's no doubt, and, and I'm going to shut up here, that there is a there is a fundamental difference. That's an opportunity. It's an opportunity if we if we actually cooperate and share that type of intelligence and what we've seen happen, because what, what happens in one place we know will in, inevitably go to another. But that's my potted version. Even building on that, Amak, and as you know, I've always been focused on collaboration. No one organisation, no one agency, no one government solve this problem on their own. Uh, Alistair and I work closely together to try and improve collaboration in Australia over the last few years. Um, when you look at the timing, you know, when, when WannaCry came out, I think Australia was fortunate in that we had warnings from other markets before, you know, it came on a Saturday morning in Australia, Friday night. So until Monday, we had time to take remedial action. Um, you know, if, if the US looked at Australia and looked at the time zones, there's some benefits to be had there and that we're ahead in time in the US. The other thing to think about is I think the three main sectors attacked in Australia, financial services, health and education, it's the same. In, I'm living in Manhattan now and it's the same up here, except I think and defence sector get a big hit as well. But I think that collaboration and sharing information could improve the resilience on both sides of the... Yeah, and if I could add to that really briefly, I think, I think you know, the, the key point that I, I want to raise, at least when I talk to our customers in the region, um, I think because the response has been so effective to dealing with COVID in Australia, um, the, the problems that people are facing now are different. They're, they're really much more about what do we do next? How do we think about society going into a post-COVID era? Uh, which is a great time to think about where you want the future to lie. And so I think that to me is, is an exciting development. I don't think we're there yet in the US. Certainly people are still dealing and grappling with the basics of, of getting an initial COVID response. Whereas I think Australia is on to that next step. And how do we bring people back in safely when they've been working remotely and they come back into the workforce, their systems will have been unmanaged, maybe unpatched, uh, potentially could be very dangerous when you bring them back in. How do we make sure that we provide the right level of protection around those systems to make that that re-entry, so to speak, safe and sane. I think that's a critical area. And I think in Australia, we're seeing a lot more thinking about forward-leaning risk. What does the word risk look like in a post-COVID-19 era? What are some of the key factors I ought to be considering as I start to measure and manage and assess and mitigate risk? And I think those two areas, in my mind, are going to be really critical. The reintroduction of the workforce and thinking about everything from a fundamental risk perspective and how the risk economics have fundamentally changed. Excellent. Well, we've got two more questions. I know we're on time, so we'll get them fairly quickly. Um, in Australia, when we talk about cyber security, it really does span the entire country from you know, Perth with ECU, uh, Skyrise in Melbourne, uh, Lot 14 in Adelaide, and New South Wales has just announced more investment into cyber security. But we're also starting to see expertise uh, come up in tech DevOps and industrial control systems. Uh, so, what are the tech clusters in Australian cyber security that you're watching closely? So I, I think we've had we you know if you look at our mining sector they they've been using um, IoT um, and remote activities for much longer than many other economies and so there's really interesting skill sets there I, I'm seeing quite a shift between breaking down that OT IT barrier that we've suffered for far too long a recognition that that that. That, that engineers and IT folk have created a gap for far too long and that we need to look at these things holistically. I think that's quite an interesting shift I'm seeing in the discussions. Um, uh, you know, and I think, and again, I'm just going to say one of the great things about alliances and strong relationships between countries, and there are a few countries with as strong a relationship as the United States and Australia, and that's not just forged in war. It's forged by, in a sense, a different but similar outlook as democracies on what the world should do and how we should protect our citizens. Uh, but what interests me, and it's probably not an answer to your question, Odette, so I apologise, is, is I think you just come to the world with a different worldview and you solve problems differently. I think Steve encapsulated it quite well and, and uh, Zufika did as well, is, is how, how, do, how do we 
Um, we, we just come at the world slightly differently. That can be disadvantaged uh, to us sometimes, but there are sometimes some really unique solutions that come out just with a group of people, a tiny population um, on the other side of the world, just look at it and go, I reckon I can solve that problem differently. And we see that constantly, how we fund it, how we then work it into global solutions. People like RSA have done a great job, you know, as was pointed out, of acquiring smart bits of technology and working it in. I'm, I don't know if I've answered your question. All right, we'll just go on to the final question. Um, and, you know, when we talk about what excites you and what, what's the, the next few trends in cyber in the next few years, um, something I've been noticing and that excites me is the American VC investment into Australian companies like Secure Code Warrior and Casada's announcements this week, you know, Intel, ForgePoint, uh, Golden Sachs, Cisco. So we're seeing a lot of investment in Australia. Do you think that will continue? Or what are some of the other trends that you think are exciting you uh, in Australian cyber security in the next couple of years? I'm going to throw to these two guys first because I rudely answered that last <laughs> one. That would have be been known as a brash Australian. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Yeah, we can't have that, Almac. We can't have that. I think that investment will continue, Odette. When you look at it, Almac before mentioned a lot of Israeli companies make a footing in Australia. That footing becomes the, the regional hub of Australia. Um, you look at Zulfar talks about buying an Australian company for uh, there is a lot of innovation come out of Australia, and I do think it's because we're big, but we're not too big. And so we have to be able to handle all the tools in the toolbox, not just one, so we can't specialise too much. So we do bring that different perspective. Uh, so often you just got to solve the problem and you've got to fix it. The downside is that often when you get a beautiful product, we want to change it and adjust it, which doesn't always work. But I think that drive for innovation is, is through necessity because we have to do so much. Yeah, if I could echo that sentiment, I think, um, you know, Alistair said something, you know, very important earlier around the idea of a trend that excites me tremendously. I think in region, especially in Australia, that trend is going to be particularly prominent. If you look at all the efforts to put broadband access across the entire country, if you look at the efforts by many of the leading organizations in Australia, and in fact, um, you know, the, one of the biggest uh, mining companies is a customer of ours. They're doing some amazing work with IoT devices to protect their workers' lives and think about safety issues. And the proliferation of IoT is, is dramatic, and the proliferation of OT and the existence of OT is also pretty dramatic. And so we see a, a phenomenal convergence. In fact, something that we've worked on very recently within RSA Labs has been this idea of, of what we call the RSA IoT Security Monitor. How do we enable our customers to know what those IoT and OT devices are doing and tie that big into their IT infrastructure so fundamentally they get one level of visibility, an umbrella of visibility across the board. I think it's going to be an important area moving forward because ultimately visibility is foundational security. One thing we've learned in the last few months is if you really want to protect your environment, if you want to manage risk, if you want to assess risk, you need visibility because you cannot manage or assess or address what you can't see. Can I just finish with one thing I did? I, <laughs> there you go. See, I ambushed you. <laughs> but firstly, I want to agree with, with the last two guys. Look, you've already mentioned this concept of, of VC money flowing in. There's no doubt. You know, I talked about the former Prime Minister's strategy in, two, in April 2016. You know, it is a remarkably and fundamentally different country now, just just over four years later. So small amounts of investment in Australia can make a big difference. You, you know, just yesterday, the New South Wales government mentioned, you know, announced $1.6 billion worth of investment in digital transformation. Now, in US dollars, that's you know, about five US dollars, but um, to us in Australia, that's a significant amount of money. Um, no, what is it? About a billion US dollars. Now that might seem to an American like not a lot of money, but to, but in Australia that is a, that is a that is a, a a fundamental shift in the way that digital economy will will develop. You you mentioned Lot Fourteen in South Australia. The South Australian Governor Premier uh, is a guy who is completely focused on on space and cybersecurity and a range of other things. Now. A small investment, 20, 30, 40 million dollars in a in a place like Adelaide, a great, you know, one of the got one of the highest ratings in the world for lifestyle, will fundamentally shift that economy. And so you don't need big buckets of money to make big muscle movements in Australia, which will be innovative test beds and development opportunities for any company. We would welcome US investment in Australia because it's you've got a strong rule of law. Uh, stable, uh, stable democratic institutions 
an interesting geopolitical place in the world, as I've mentioned, which gives you a different insight. Um, and, and a group of people who look at the world in a different way, our friends in New Zealand are the same. Whenever I go there, I think, wow, you look at it differently to us, but you're so close. And that's what I think a smart investment strategy looks like. You, put, you pick your places and you put them and you say, how can that be accretive to me? Australia is certainly one of those places, there's no doubt. There enters the sermon, Odette. <laughs> Thanks, Al Mike. Thanks, Phil, for coming That was a terrific discussion. I'm sure we could keep going for hours, um, but we are about seven minutes over. So I thank everyone for, for all of your comments. I thank our attendees for coming along to today, but also to all the other five events that we had throughout the week. If you missed any of the others, we can send our um, recordings. Um, if you want to engage with Austrade or with anyone else, please do reach out to us. We're happy to have uh, conversations and take this discussion further. Uh, we love talking about Australia and North America and the opportunities to do business. I'd also like to thank my Austrade team who have been terrific in putting this week together. Um, so thanks everybody and um, have a good evening, uh, morning. See you all. Hey, thank you.